So I'm on the bus on Wednesday because I have to take the bus to campus and I'm on the bus and I run into my roommate, which like never happens. And so we're sitting next to the each other on the bus. And before I get on the bus, I call I'm on a call with my best friend. And so we're chatting, you know, spilling the tea. We're catching up. And I see my roommate and I'm like, oh, my God, like she overhears what I'm talking about. And she also knows what I'm talking about. She's like, oh, my God, you're going to have to fill me in on this later. And I'm like, OK, yeah, for sure. So. I have my AirPods in, and this is a big part of the story. So I have my AirPods in. We are chatting. We are, you know, spilling the tea. Me and my best friend are. My roommate is sitting directly next to me on the bus. She is also on the phone. And I'm on the phone for like 20 minutes. And I get off the phone. I put my AirPods away, and I'm like, oh my God, I was screaming. Everyone on this bus knows everything about my business because when I put my AirPods back in their fucking case, you could hear a pin drop. So now I'm really embarrassed and I don't ever want to take public transportation again. You're going to give us some some hints about your business or just going to leave that up to, the, was, to the viewers, was, to the listeners? It, to say. it was ex-roommate drama. It was like tea that like she had told like my ex-roommate had told me never it was work stuff that, that was going thing. on and like i full named people like i included their names we chatted about her exes like we we taught we it was it was bad like we covered a lot of ground in that 20 minutes <laughs> and then obama you know obama right yeah you know <laughs> boy he's causing trouble stirring up shit in my neck of the woods no, I like randomly went to a barbecue right when I moved here because my roommate was like, oh, I'm going to this thing. Like, do you want to come with it? And I was like, yeah, for sure. So I went and we were like ta- sitting around talking and this girl just randomly dropped. She's like, oh, yeah, my dad like golfs with Obama all the weekends. And I was like, how do you just drop that? Like, what? <laughs> but anyways, you are listening to Why Would No Date These Guys with Naomi Guy. That's Joel Guy over there. He's pretty cool. And we talk about all things sex, dating, relationships, media surrounding all of those topics. We do it all. But today we're going to start off with our drink of the week. Joel, what are you drinking? Um, I have something called, I don't know the title, Fruit Biotic Complex, The Secret what? Nature of Fruit. I, I don't know. There's multiple things on here. It's okay. a probiotic fruit soda, refreshing peach flavor. It's going to give me gut health support with over 2 billion, that's in all caps, 2 billion <laughs> probiotics. Um, so, I don't know. I like peaches. I like drinks. Let's 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 give it a gander. Okay. It tastes like peach sparkling water. It was no. much more expensive than peach sparkling water. Um, yeah. So sad. I don't know. I don't hate it. Uh, maybe I'll have really, really good gut health moving forward, but... Um, yeah, if you already have really, really good gut health or you don't like peaches, you can probably skip this one. How do you test your gut health, just out of curiosity? Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, poop samples would be my guess. Okay, so moving on, I am also I also have a drink this week. I am drinking mm-hmm. the um, Villa Italia Italian Blood Orange Soda, which I think we've already talked about on this podcast but i didn't want to show up empty-handed so i'm going to retry it for everyone My popular it's also been open for four days a special so, appearance um, it's not sparkly but it definitely tastes like blood orange so good on you villa italia i got this product from trader joe's but it's not a trader joe's product it's a product of italy look i do want to discuss our book but can we just talk about trader joe's for a second yes because those yes. bastards what those they do to you? jerks over at Trader Joe's have always kind of coasted by on their like vaguely progressive liberal bona fides. They're like, oh, look at us. We're so cool and hip and all of our food (laughs) is like dietary inclined. We recognize gluten-free people exist. We got a whole vegan section. Hey, come out and hang out with us after work. We got the good weed, you know, like that. that's kind of the vibe that Trader Joe's has cultivated. Of and course. this hasn't made a lot of news media, but apparently the Trader Joe's parent corporation signed on with SpaceX, which <gasps> should should raise your eyebrows no. a bit. And they are suing 
in federal court, the NLRB, the National Labor Review Board, Relations Board, uh, which is the government agency that, like, defends workers' rights and, like, is the reason unions are having such a moment right now. Uh, and the whole reason they're doing this is because the Trader Joe's in the Northeast somewhere unionized. And Trader Joe's is like, oh, we don't want that. We don't want our workers recognizing they have rights. Um, so, yeah, like now I can't shop at Trader Joe's, which is disappointing because they're a great place to drop one hundred and fifty dollars in one go. Um, and, you know, where am I going to go now? Like Whole Foods? God, no. I don't want to give Jeff Bezos any money. AJ's? I can't afford AJ's. No one can Joel, afford AJ's. AJ's Joel, exists just you... so princes can laugh at us. That's true. I do have to say that by the time Joel is done figuring out who everyone is in bed with, like these big companies are in bed with, he will not ever leave his house again. Hell, he'll probably burn down his own house because the architect of his house probably was in bed with Frank Lloyd Wright, who is bad for some reason. So um, just to let people know, um, Joel is, he's, he's, he's going to become a hermit. He's not even going to buy his cat's food anymore because he's going to find out that Friskies is really bad and has glyphosate, glyphosates in it. And actually I did learn that this week. Um, check your cat food for glyphosates because that will cause (laughs) cancer in your cats. So, um, and that's not just me like being a conspiracy theorist. Um, I actually learned that in my class. So suck it, Joel. Um, yeah, Joel. Joel's done. Joel is Joel's becoming a hermit. He's done. He's 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 given up on the world. After this, he thought that Trader Joe's was his one true home. He's done. He's he feels so betrayed right now. Also, it is the National Labor I'm Relations so Board. I'm so excited to edit episodes. Thank you. I'm so excited <laughs> to edit these episodes because I can just like cut out big chunks and make Naomi look like she's just randomly going on rants for no reason. You are so um, rude. I don't do that to you. What the fuck? <laughs> I even edit out Look, my burps, you know, so shush. I want our audience to know how much I burp. That is important <laughs> to me. But speaking of things that are important to me, uh, enough of giving cats cancer and Trader Joe's sucking. Let us get back to talking about sex with your partner. How does that sound, Naomi? Does that sound good, Naomi? Naomi? Yes. I lost you okay. for like a full um, minute there. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. It's it showed that you were you were saying things, but I didn't hear anything. Uh, so wow, this is going to be a great, great. We we need to figure this out. We need to do something. Come on, Riverside, pick up the game. So Naomi, where we left off is we worked through basically chapter one and chapter two of the book. We discussed kind of the like problems people have with sex, and then some like basic things to consider prior to engaging with your partner about you know things that you either want in your sex life or things you feel uncomfortable with. Uh, I did mention we were basically skipping chapter three, which deals a lot with trauma. Uh, pick up this book. You know, it's a good book. Uh, we, we endorse it. One of the few things we've read on our podcast where we're like, oh, this is not horribly objectionable. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot we're going to skip through. So we're not just, you know, summarizing the entire text. Uh, we do think the author is probably deserving the money. Well, one of the authors. I do have the to the say. Guy, not so much. <laughs> Sander. Yeah. So we were talking about this before the podcast. We started recording. Um, I am a hater, like through and through, I'm a hater. Um, so I actually started listening to this book um on Spotify because Spotify now, and this isn't sponsor sponsored. I hate that I'm even saying this, but I think it's a great resource. I pay for Spotify premium every month. Um, and mm. I they actually I know, and they started um offering audiobooks. So I found this on Spotify because I picked it up myself and um I started listening to it and Xander has like these little excerpts who is like the woman who wrote this book, her partner, um, is co-writing, co-writing. I say that loosely this book with her. And so he has his own little excerpts at the end of the episode and he narrates it himself and, um, it's awful. So, um, I'm a hater <laughs> through and through. Okay. But anyways, with that in mind, I do have to say let us one more form thing. Form a foundation for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done interrupting you. I want to take a nap. I'm sorry. It's not against you. I just, I'm just tired. Okay, go ahead. Do your thing. No, no, please get to your one more thing, Naomi. Go listen to audiobooks on Spotify. It's a great resource. (laughs) Great. I would say go support your local library, which also has books on tape, but um, maybe not the form you want. Okay, so chapter four, building the foundation for your sex talks. 
So there's five basic rules that you need to keep in mind when talking with your partner about sex. And I want to reiterate that like a lot of these rules are actually really helpful rules for all parts of your life. They don't explicitly apply to like sex. Like these are conversations you can have with your partner about a wide variety of things. These are skills you can utilize when talking with coworkers, with bosses. Um, now, I'm not going to say everything in this book is a one to one, but like definitely don't think that this is so limiting as to be only applicable to talking with your partners about, you know, sex. First one is name your intentions. Second is see yourself as a team. Third is start softly. Four is using I language. And five is going slow. So the first one is name your intentions. And Vanessa says, people get pretty damn nervous about communication, especially when it involves sex. Those nerves lead us to rehearse conversations in our head, imagining dozens of horrible scenarios of how they can go wrong. But here's what you need to remind yourself. You have good intentions and positive goals driving your desire to communicate. It's not like you picked up this book thinking, I hope Vanessa teaches me the best ways to destroy my partner's confidence and ruin our relationship. Remind yourself of your positive intentions often, especially before approaching your partner. Take a deep breath and tell yourself, I'm initiating this conversation because I love my partner and I know we're capable of a smoking hot sex life. Give yourself this pep talk can soothe your anxiety and help you go into the conversation feeling stronger. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, like, if you don't see the relationship working out, having a good sex life might not be your top priority. I don't know. What do you think? No, I definitely, I, I, I would agree with that. I think that the basics of this book is just, like, making sure that you have that emotional connection along with that physical connection. And she's not, she's trying to reinforce that you can have a great sex life along with having a great relationship. And so a lot of these conversations go, they're kind of like a Venn diagram of both of those aspects of your life or your relationship. Yeah. Uh, Second one, see yourself as a team. One of the best things you can do for your relationship is think of you and your partner as teammates working together against whatever is getting in the way of having the sex life of the wildest dreams. No partner is the single problem child. You are two individuals who brought history, complications, and ever-evolving needs to your relationship, and your task is to spread all of it out in front of you and say, okay, how do we make sense of this together? As you're reading through the rest of the book, take a what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine kind of approach to your challenges and think about how the puzzle pieces fit together. Give your teammate the benefit of the doubt during your sex talks. If things start to become heated, it can be easy to feel like your partner is purposefully trying to hurt or upset you, and they're probably going to be thinking the exact same thing about you. Challenge yourself to think about the good intentions your partner has in every situation. Ask yourself, what positive feeling does my partner want from their words or actions, even if they're going about things in an unskilled manner? Um, yeah, again, that's really good advice for most problem topics. Like, it's totally possible that you might run into a scenario where, like, one partner is completely wrong about something. But even in that scenario, this is probably good advice for navigating a conversation, right? People easily feel personally attacked. People have fragile egos about a lot of stuff. Like, always frame it as, like, you two versus the problem rather than you two versus each other. And you're going to have a much better conversation. Yeah. Did I lose you? No, I just didn't have much to say. I completely agree with your your perspective on that. It'd be so nice we could see each other, because then you could just give me a thumbs up or something. Um, damn. Appreciate you, Riverside. <laughs> start softly. Research has found that the way you start a conversation predicts how it will end. In fact, relationship expert John Gottman is famous for being able to predict the likelihood of a couple's divorce by observing just the first three minutes of a conflict discussion. The way you start conversations is that important. When it comes to having your sex talks, make sure the conditions are right. Don't try to talk to your partner when they're cooking dinner, when you need to leave in 10 minutes to get to a doctor's appointment, when they're obviously stressed by the looming work deadline. Check in with yourself, too. There's a helpful acronym you can use here, HALT. If you feel hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, H-A-L-T, take a moment to address those feelings before talking to your partner. Only initiate conversations when you both have the space and energy to properly have them. Another way to start softly is to initiate any big conversations by labeling your baggage. Acknowledge the challenges you and your partner have faced or are currently facing when it comes to a healthy relationship. For example, I know we are both raised Catholic and are still carrying a lot of shame about sex. This reminds you both that the difficulties aren't your fault, that there are understandable reasons why you're struggling, and that you're a team. Here's a funny trick you can use. Imagine that you're talking to a friend instead of a partner. 
Most of us listen to our friends more closely, and we have lowly, lower expectations and more patience for them. We tend to give them the benefit of the doubt, and we don't get as triggered by what they say or do. Imagine one of your best friends in front of you when you're talking to your partner, and watch your communication transform. This is good yeah, advice. I, it is. I like it a lot because it's also similar to her, like, um, personifying when she was giving the advice of like personifying your ins- your sexual insecurities with your partner, like, oh, Deborah, you yeah. suck, or I don't remember the name that she used, but I like that you like are. She's not making you identify with those feelings. She's like, okay, this is completely different, and she's taking that piece of you outside of yourself so you can look at it from a different perspective, which I really use I language. You've probably heard this one before. It's an oldie but a goodie. Instead of saying you did this or you did that, talk about your personal reactions and experiences using I, me, and my. So instead of you never want to spend time with me, you say I've been feeling lonely lately and I've been wanting to feel more connected to you. If you're feeling stuck, here's an easy framework to use. I feel X and I need Y. Notice how that worked in the prior example. I'm feeling lonely and I need more connection. Using I language cuts defensiveness off at the pass. If you tell them your partner, if you tell your partner you did this, it's going to feel like an attack to them, and it's likely to trigger an argumentative response like, no, I didn't. But if you talk about your own experience, it's less likely to inflame that defensiveness for you. Uh, This also helps you identify the feelings that are coming up for you. Your feelings are what need tending to when you're upset, not the actual details of what happened. I'll give you a great example. If you say you haven't initiated sex in months, your partner is going to respond with something like, yes, I have. I did so three weeks ago. Then the conversation turns into a debate about exactly how many weeks it's been since they initiated. No, it's been months. No, the last time was before Rudy's birthday party, and that was this month. But what about those feelings about initiation? Are you feeling sad, lonely, resentful? All those emotions get lost in that argument. And the worst part is, you're never ever going to agree about logistics. You're going to be convinced about your timeline, the partner's going to be convinced about their part timeline, and those two things are never going to match up. It's feelings that matter, so using eye language will help you access that deeper layer. And then okay. the last one is going slow. The golden rule has two meanings, go to slow speed and tackle things one at a time. Most of us tend to speed up when we're nervous or upset. Your partner senses you starting to get more intense, and they get more intense in response. Before you know it, you're having a conversation at breakneck pace, but going fast creates a lot of problems. You're much more likely to interpret your partner's words as negative, even if they're not. You're much less likely to listen fully, and you're much less likely to express yourself properly. When you're going too fast, you end up stumbling over your own thoughts, um, and... Sorry, when you're going too fast, you end up stumbling over your own thoughts and words. That was me going too fast and stumbling over my own thoughts and words. <laughs> so what to, what to always do to never fight is number six. And it's kind of confusingly worded, and that's deliberate. Because she says, I'm just kidding. Always and never are two of the least helpful words for couples. It is extremely rare in life that something always happens or never happens. It's just not accurate language. Those two words will automatically put your partner on the defensive and make them feel trapped. If they're always or never doing something, you're essentially saying it's inca- they're incapable of doing anything different. Um, these words also set the bar pathetically low for improvement. So if you tell your partner, hey, you never give me compliments, all they have to do is give you one compliment to prove you wrong. Right. And that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is you feel as though you're not, you're rarely complimented. And so what you want to do is present it in such a manner that you are consistently getting feedback and compliments, which is what the argument is about. OK. Number seven, make space for new behaviors. Um, if you actually want your partner to change, which is something partners can do. I know Steve Harvey doesn't believe it, but uh, <laughs> Vanessa seems to believe it. Um, you need to make space in order to allow your partner to change. So, um, uh, the, the, the framing of this is weird. She doesn't really articulate it. She's basically just saying that, like, you should present them in such a manner, you should hype them up in such a manner that, like, they have the opportunity to alter their behavior. You can't frame them as, like, being too powerless in order to change or too, like, scared of change. You have to be like, yeah, I think they're interested, but, you know, they haven't made the moves yet or something. So the example she gives is Rashida dragged her husband Anthony into a couple session because she wanted him to be more aggressive and dominant in the bedroom. But he'll never do it, she said. There's never again. He's too shy. Anthony was seated right next to her on the sofa, staring intently at his feet. And believe it or not, he didn't change a thing. So when you start framing people as like having certain personality quirks and flaws that like would prevent them from doing something, 
you prevent them from doing something. It becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Number eight, close your mouth and open your ears. Um, so like this may be something that you initiate, but like your partner probably is going to have similar things to discuss. So make sure that like you give your partner full and undivided attention, the same as you would expect. Uh, don't multitask, make eye contact, turn your body towards them. Um, there's a little trick that Vanessa says you learn a lot in psychology class. Oh, there's one of the burps now he's going to keep in. <laughs> uh, there's a little trick you'll learn in any psychology one-on-one class, active listening. After your partner has finished talking, try to summarize what they just said in your own words. Start with, so what I'm hearing is, or what that sounded like to me is, dot dot dot. Ask them if you're correctly capturing what they said, and if your partner says not exactly, ask them to clarify what they originally meant. This makes it clear to your partner that it's important that you understand what they're trying to say, and it'll cut off misunderstandings before they snowball into huge fights. And the last one is pretty obvious, like, be compassionate, don't be a dick about it. Recognize that, like, there might be some stupid stuff that, like, people say, and it might be a poor articulation, it might be, like, genuinely a shitty belief that they, like, have. Um, understand that, like, if you want people to change, you have to give them room to change, and let it may be difficult for them to have these conversations, or they may say stuff you don't want to hear. Um, yeah, I think that's good advice for most stuff in a relationship. Naomi, of these nine principles, which would you say is, you know, the most helpful? Or what are some of the ones you think are probably the most helpful for a couple discussions? Um, so I think that, I think this is funny that I keep saying I, the I statements is um, something that is very helpful in conversations with your partner in any sense, not just in conversations about your sex life. Um, I think it's a really great way to communicate your own feelings and not put the blame on the other person. Because to, all too often, like you said, with the never conversations, it's, oh, you never do this. Instead, you could say, I feel like you never, you know, initiate sex or things like that. So you're taking the um, you're, you're taking the blame off of them. And so it's a, it's a you, it's a you and them problem. It's not just a them problem. Um, the other thing is like the active listening, because I feel like all too often people don't communicate, um, that they don't totally understand your point. And that's where a lot of miscommunication happens. So when you are, um, having these conversations that are so vital for not just your sex life, but every part of your relationship, um, it's extremely essential to have a full understanding of what your partner is saying. And I think that having those, yes, it could be a lot of repeating back exactly what you said, but it could be that you guys are, you know, having a full understanding of each other and it becomes even more of a safe space where you guys can openly talk about a lot more things because you guys are on the same page. Uh, no, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I have mixed feelings about one of these, and that is the um, making, starting softly, you know, constructing the, the, the place you, you discuss that conversation so that it is in a particularly stressful time or environment. And I understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from. But she also, like, opened the book and talked about how one of the reasons that, like, discussing your sex life is so difficult is because a lot of people are just constantly busy and don't have a space in their home that they can have this discussion. So I think it would have mm -hmm. been helpful to, like, give some advice of how to create, like, a softer environment. Like, hey, maybe do this on, I, I don't know if this is good advice, date night. Maybe do this, you know, when the kids are asleep. Maybe do this, you know, maybe there's a specific time of the year that it's less likely people are going to be stressed. Like, I'm sure around the holiday season is probably a very bad time. Close to birthdays, probably a very bad time. Um, yeah, I would have liked to see a little more discussion about that, because I do think one of the big things that prevents people from having these conversations, besides not having the skills, is just there never being the right time and place. So don't say, get a good time and place, say, here's how you construct a good time and place for these conversations. Yeah, she talked a little bit about that, like, sort of sense of, like, not having any privacy with, um, like, in part one of the of this series that we did, where she was talking about, like, her client who felt like she was, like, her kids were her cock box because no matter what, they didn't have any privacy. And so I think that these conversations are just as vital to create that space of, like, okay, you have that privacy because, you know, these conversations can 
and might turn heated. And so you have, and not in like the sexy way, in like the yelling kind of way. And so obviously you don't want to be having these conversations with your kids around. I also don't think that you want your kid walking in on you describing what exactly doggy style that you want the next time you guys have sex. So um, There's yeah, different I, types I agree. of doggy style? <laughs> oh man, I have so much to learn. There's God. Dalmatian <laughs> style. There's Greg Mountain Hound style. There's I really like dog style. <laughs> <laughs> Pomeranian style. Exactly. That's Let's where your partner really is like dude. completely rolled up in a blanket. <laughs> I was thinking you were just have to do a doggy style with a hairy dude. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll go with that. Okay, with that, we are going to skip to chapter five. And chapter five is the first kind of conversation to have with your partner um, in your series of sex talks. Oh, man, we're, we're, we're finally getting to the meat of the book. I, I do genuinely Ooh. think that, like, all this background stuff is important. Um, it's really important to, you know, not butcher the wind up so that the, you know, message is communicated properly. Uh, but, yeah, this is, I think, really where the book gets even better than just, like, general topics of how to talk properly with your partner. Um, so chapter five is acknowledgement. And the first sex talk you have to have is acknowledging that sex is a thing and we have it. So um, this, I think, stems from the fact that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about sex in the first place. Like, it's difficult to have a constructive conversation about something where, like, both people don't really want to use certain words. Uh, both individuals, you know, feel uncomfortable saying penis, for instance. I, I think that would certainly uh, make any conversation either awkward or um, not as helpful as it could be. If you're not getting, you know, sort of specific about what your desires are, you probably will not get what you actually want at the end of the day. Would you agree? No, I, yeah, definitely agree with that. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, you know, people carry a lot of baggage. Um, people might actually, you know, just not be educated. This is something we've talked about, you know, sex education in America uh, and the West can be pretty bad at times. And so it's important to make sure that, you know, everyone's kind of on the same page. So the first conversation, the first talk you need to have with your partner, and this doesn't have to be one, it can be multiple conversations, is acknowledging the fact that you two have sex. It's a thing that exists. It's a thing couples do. It's something you two have have done before in theory um and so you need to you know spell it out um and and acknowledging is partially a description it, it's partially a like hey these are things that we've done here's the things we do but it's also partially a bringing it up into more of a easy conversation topic it doesn't need to be something where you talk about once and then never again, right? It needs to be something you can constantly be discussing in a relationship. Because if you go through all these steps once in, like, say, your 20s, it's very possible other things are going to come up in your relationship later down the line. It's very possible that, like, you have an injury and suddenly, you know, sex is uncomfortable and you need to talk with your partner about that and what you're going to do to adapt. Uh, it's possible that, like, you're feeling super drained and you no longer want to have as much sex because you're having stress at work. Uh, it's possible that, you know, this is something that, you know, is being researched more and more. Your sexuality might have changed slightly. You know, there seems to be some evidence that, like, people's attraction to the opposite sex or the same sex can change over time. Um, and that can be part of the aging process. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's important that you are continuously having these conversations with your partner you're not treating this as like a one-off one and done great we've done this awkward thing and now we no longer have to do it again no it needs to be continuous okay no i think that's great advice because i feel like a lot of people like think that these are you know kind of kinks in their relationship that you know they'll go to a relationship therapist and work through once and they'll be fine with it yeah so the first thing the the first, like, most important thing is to make sure you are constantly complimenting your partner. Um, you should be constantly giving them specific and positive pieces of feedback. Don't give them specific and negative pieces of feedback. That doesn't go over well. In fact, when you give negative feedback, maybe don't make it specific. Uh, but when you're giving positive feedback, make sure that it's specific. So kick off compliments by telling your partner how attracted you are to them. Keep them light, playful, and flirty. Even if your partner has a hard time taking a compliment, it is still going to register that you're making a new effort. It's fine if they don't necessarily reciprocate the compliments now. The point is to just open the conversational door. Give your partner a compliment a day for one week. So here are some examples. And Naomi, I'm going to need you to give me some examples after, you know, so, okay. so we're not just, you know, reading this book. We're actually constructing it. 
So okay. look at those arm muscles. Can't cut. Why don't you come wrap them around me? Wow, you're beautiful. I can't take my eyes off you. Damn, you're looking good today. I don't know if that's specific. <laughs> that shirt is so flattering on you. It brings out the color of your eyes. Did you know I'm still as attracted to you as I was the day you met? You met who? Did the day we met or the day you we met? met? Okay. You said the day you met and I was like, the day you I met, met who? Obama. <laughs> Obama. You guys golf all the time You're still now. attractive. Yeah, as when I met Obama and you were like the, the, the caddy boy and our eyes met and then Obama did something and I had to talk about him on the bus. Um, okay. Nami, give me I... some more compliments. What are some things you can compliment about your partner? Um, Pookie, you just look so ravishing today. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sorry, did um... you say Pookie? <laughs> it's like this new thing. Naomi, I know who Pookie like... is in your life. I don't like that. No. No, 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 no. So this is a thing that's going on around Instagram and TikTok right now. And it's like um, this guy who is like, who has this wife that's way out of his league. And um, this, um, he, he, she does like these outfit, like, she's like, oh, this is what I'm wearing to dinner tonight. And she, he goes every single, every single time they do a video together, Pookie, you just look so ravishing tonight. So everyone around like in, on Instagram and stuff is like, I Pookie, see. You just look so good today. So, anyways, um, I would say, um, compliment the color of the shirt if they look really, really good in it. Um, I actually did this this week with my partner because um, he looked really good in yellow this week. Um, also, just like I think that not necessarily complimenting them with words, but maybe just like taking a picture of them and being like, "Wow, you look really cute right now." Like, um, I'll send you that picture so you know how cute you are. Um, stuff like that, like where you, you have the compliment, but you also back it up with an action I feel is even stronger. I I think that's good advice. Um, I like it when my partner smells really nice and, you know, every so often she'll use like a really nice smelling shampoo or some body butter or something. And I will try to make it a point to, you know, call that out and be like, wow, that smells great. Your skin is so soft. You say, something like that. You say pookie. Um, You smell so good today. I don't say her skin is super soft after she's shampooed. (laughs) <laughs> Pookie, you smell so good today. Nope, nope, I'm not doing that. See, I'm uncomfortable. I'm not willing to acknowledge this. Okay, so once you've gotten more comfortable with giving compliments, it is time to officially acknowledge your sex life. Uh, so she's going to give two, as she calls them, choose your own adventure paths for a proceeding based on whether you're the one initiating the conversation or if you and your partner are reading this book together. Um, So I think that's really helpful where like you don't have to be the only person like shouldering this burden. If both you and your partner are like acknowledging their issues with your sex life, um, you can both go at this uh, at the same time and not have to, you know, put all the burden on one person. So if you're doing it on your own, here are some things to consider. So option one is the African safari method. And you know what? you, you, You basically come up to your partner in a comfortable, calm environment outside the bedroom and say, Something like, you know what I randomly was thinking about today? And then give a quick sentence or two about your favorite sexual memory with your partner. The other option is the hot potato method. So we have the African safari method where you randomly bring stuff up. And the hot potato method is if you feel nervous starting with your own memory, you can put the responsibility on your partner's shoulders with a slight tweak. What is your favorite sexual memory with me? If you're worried about catching your partner off guard with the question, you can soften the approach by saying something like, I know this isn't something we usually talk about, but I had a funny question pop into my head today and I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite sexual memory? Make sure you have your own answer ready to share with your partner. Uh, So the question um, that you're probably going to ask Naomi is, why is it called the African Safari Method? I want to know, Joel. I'm intrigued. Uh, apparently, uh, Vanessa and Xander will use this phrase. Uh, they'll make references to safaris when they're both feeling playful or adventurous or whatnot, because apparently they went on vacation in Africa a couple of years ago and they banged in a tree house outside of like the place they were staying. And this is like considered one of their fondest memories, like having sex to the sounds of elephants trumpeting nearby. (laughs) You know what? It happens. Yeah. So, um... After you both have shared a memory, change the subject, talk about something else. If your partner presses you about why you brought it up, say something like, like, it just popped into my head. Uh, The other option you have is, like, you don't necessarily need to do this in person. You can do it digitally. Uh, Send one of your conversation openers to your partner via email or text. 
Um, it may be very uncomfortable approaching your partner if you've never discussed anything like this before. But, you know, if you're at work and they're at work and you aren't doing anything, you know, potentially initiate like that. Um, and then a day or two after that first conversation, loop back around and let your partner know you enjoyed talking about sex with them. Make sure to give them lots of praise. Say something like, I realize I asked you a pretty out of the blue question about our sex life the other day, but I like talking to you about it. It made me feel close to you. Thank you for being willing to have that conversation with me. What you want to be doing is creating a link between emotional intimacy and physical intimacy and show your partner that communication plays a big role in helping you feel close. Um, if that initial conversation felt tough for one or both of you, you should add something like, I want us to both feel comfortable talking about sex, but wow, it's really hard, isn't it? I'm proud that we're both willing to keep trying, even though it is challenging. How are we feeling? Feeling good. Feeling educated. I think that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> and again, I think what's most helpful about this is a lot of advice books we read give advice that might seem kind of useful but the advice can be awkward or weird or frustrating or something that is going to make you step outside of your comfort zone and so it's not really actionable right like people are looking for advice about finance or dating or business or any other you know aspects of you know life and the advice is well what if you were a completely different person right? <laughs> what if you weren't like a nervous wreck? What if you were a confident person? Try being that confident person. And for some people that can work, but I think for the vast majority of people, like the advice being do something completely different than you would normally do is just not helpful, right? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. But I also think that, I don't know, different people need different advice. Like you said, like, just works out for some people like this might be this book might be great advice for us but might not be great advice for the next person yeah so again you know acknowledging that this is a difficult thing and that you need you know constant affirmations and you need support from others is much better i think for the long term and it also you know if for instance you are feeling particularly confident at one point in your relationship when you want to talk about sex, but not necessarily feeling confident in another point in your relationship when you want to talk about sex, this gives you the tools to be successful in both of those conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next piece of advice in the acknowledgement section is the post game. So she says, now that you've had the experiences with talking about your sex life separate from the act, let's up the ante and start the conversation when it's freshest on your mind. And so she calls it the post game because it's like after sporting events where like a bunch of talking heads get together and they're like, oh, man, Johnson really made a great play today. I, I don't you know, I did not intentionally say Johnson, but I could not have chosen a better sports player name. I didn't even catch that. It's funny. Man, Dick was really good on the field tonight. <laughs> He really scored, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Hey, with the safari, so yeah, so she's like, with, with the safari example, they ahead. could have really been in a field. <laughs> That's stupid. Uh, okay. Um, so she says, you know, there are some benefits to talking about sex. Uh, to to talk about sex right after having it, um, namely that it's top of the mind. You don't have to start the conversation out of anywhere. You know, if you're hugging your partner post-coitus, it is much easier to initiate that conversation. You've just had a specific experience to discuss and use an example, and you're feeling, you know, connected to the other person. Uh, it also is probably the best situation to have the talk. Like, I'm not saying that, like, every single time is going to be perfect, but, like, obviously it is weird bringing up sex in the middle of the day. It's far less weird bringing up sex when you have just or in the middle of having sex, right? Like, it's it's a far better environment. If you're in a place where you've just had sex, the likelihood that you are comfortable, that you're not being interrupted, that you're not feeling particularly stressed is, is much higher than it is, you know, when you're running out the door to get to the doctor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So for the first post game, zone right in on compliments. Tell your partner they're a good kisser, that their breasts look fantastic. Call out standout moments and say things like, you know, that thing you did where you use both hands on me. I really loved that. For the second post game, try repeating, sorry, try requesting a repeat for next time. Say things like, I liked it when you grabbed me and tossed me on the bed. You can do that again in the future. This is a great way to ease into making requests to the partner. It feels light and fun since you're grounding the requests in positive, positive feedback and compliments, <laughs> but you're still making a specific ask. Once you're feeling more confident, you can use the post game to ask for something new. 
The key here is to continue anchoring it with a compliment. For example, I really liked you telling me how hot I am. What do you think about trying out even more dirty talk next time? The only thing to keep out of a post game is criticism. We don't want the sexual equivalent to Branson really blew that clutch play in the final seconds. It's too sensitive of a time to bring anything remotely critical. Focus on what you did like and what you want to try going forward. Okay. I like this advice because I feel like a lot of people will um, take that opportunity. Yeah. Say like, Oh, I didn't, you know, finish or anything like that. But I think that if you're trying to build these like, more close connections that you should definitely only compliment and then like later on if you guys are having like you know a talk about it outside of the bedroom and not directly after sex that then you can bring up those oh I didn't like when you did this like that wasn't my favorite thing yeah. um but I think that definitely like having those those positive um sort of, like those positive reinforcements for your partner is a good thing um so she says that by constantly acknowledging sex by constantly talking about it uh it's eventually going to morph into flirting so it's not a one and done conversation as i said it's going to be a continuous process so a lot of people come to her and are like vanessa we used to have like really magical connection early in our relationship and we no longer feel that same connection um and she says look you know one of the problems is you know a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about sex so you can't have the same experience of like flirtation and like being all sexy like if you're not even willing to like talk about the acts that are involved um so she says there are a couple ways you can turn acknowledgement into flirting uh continue giving each other compliments obviously reference positive experiences like i had so much fun with you last night or i can't get what you did out of your head make suggestive comments or jokes talk positively about your partner in front of other people leave little notes for each other just something simple one or two sentences send sweet messages as texts and cat call or wolf whistle them. Um, I don't know about the last one. I, I think a lot of women might negatively associate cat calling and wolf whistling. I'm sure plenty of women are perfectly happy to receive that, but maybe gauge their reaction when you do it once or twice uh, before you decide to turn it into a continuous thing. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I definitely, um, you know, I like a little flirtation, but I, I wouldn't want to associate it with um people that are trying to harass me so yeah yeah like if, if uh, you walk past a construction site and the construction workers are always like eh, i nice wasn't shooter. gonna wanna... generalize like that <laughs> calm down i wasn't gonna say construction of course, site. Of course, the impression i was doing of course the impression i was doing was that a female construction worker who just mm, happens to okay. be a little aggressive so like i think you're generalizing a bit too much too a non-binary construction worker Okay, um, there are some common pitfalls that can come up, and she does have this in most of the sections of the book where it's like, hey, this seems pretty straightforward, but also there might be some specific stuff. Uh, so, you know, one might be what happens if you're in the middle of a massive dry spell. And she's like, well, most couples have dry spells in their relationships. Uh, she conducted a casual poll on Instagram, and 93% of the followers said that they had gone through dry spells at some point in a relationship, right? And this can well... happen due to childbirth, illness, injury, life circumstances interpersonal issues or anything else mm -hmm. um so she's like look it's always going to be awkward right it doesn't matter if you've been in a dry spell doesn't matter if your sex life is continuous or like is kind of you know sporadic it, there's never going to be like a perfect time to get into it um and she says you got to rip the bandage off the longer you go without talking about sex the harder and harder it'll feel to start a conversation so she says look the way to initiate it is this tell your partner i know our sex life isn't where either of us wants it to be i don't know about you but for me it feels awkward to talk about it but i want to have that conversation because i love you and i care about our intimacy i'm not saying we need to jump right back in the sack but can we talk about how to to start slowly rebuilding our connection yeah. Okay. And again, I like the phrasing of this because she's giving you like tools you could copy. And I think even someone who's read this book is going to be like, yeah, having these conversations is awkward. If you need to like steal someone else's words in order to like make it feel genuine. Yeah, do that. I prefer you do that over us like never having a conversation about it and going through the rest of our life miserable. Yeah. Um. The other thing she brings up, and I think this is helpful advice, is um, she's had people in the past be like, my wife doesn't want to talk about her sex life at all. When I've tried, she's like, we shouldn't have to talk about her sex life. It should just be natural. 
And Vanessa says this is probably due to shame and perfection. Uh, most of us feel so embarrassed and awkward about sex, but don't want to acknowledge its existence. The pressure we feel to have perfect effortless sex makes us feel like something's wrong with us. if We have to talk about it. I know it can be frustrating to get this kind of response from your partner, but try to tap into your compassion. Imagine how much pressure they're feeling and how badly they are suffering. So catch your partner in a quiet moment and say things like, I've heard you say we shouldn't have to talk about our sex life. I want you to know that I see talking about sex as a way of building intimacy. It makes me feel closer to you to talk about it. It is not about complaining or solving problems. It is just about being able to acknowledge the special act we get to share with one another. We talk about every other aspect of our relationship, and I want us to talk about this too. I don't like the phrase like special that. act. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't the best, but I, I like that <laughs> she's including the clear and concise conversations that you should be having with your partner. Okay, so I think we're done with the first big talk you have to have with your partner, which is acknowledgement. And I think, Naomi, we have time to get through the second big talk, which is connection. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Cool. So the second conversation is connection. And acknowledgement was about acknowledging the fact that sex is a thing you do sometimes. And connection is acknowledging what you need in order to feel close to your partner. Um, so she describes that, like, even as a sex therapist, um, she has difficulty at times with her sex life. And that's why it's kind of weird, like, writing this with your partner. Like, it's great that, like, you have this open, casual relationship, but it also feels very, very strange to write this book where, like, your partner is probably reading and editing it alongside you and gets to see all of your specific complaints about them. That is very odd. Yeah. I didn't even think about yeah. that. It's like, you know, Naomi, when we inevitably write our book on dating, I'm going to have mm -hmm. a lot of complaints about you. And you're going to be oh. like, you know, when I was living with Joel when we were younger, Joel used to snore all the time. He sucks. I can't believe anyone would ever want to marry him. That's so sad because I like literally asked Lauren about it. I was like, how do you deal with his snoring? And she's like, actually, I find it really comforting. And I was like, that's really cute. You guys are meant to be. Oh. So I don't <laughs> even know if I believe this. I, and we're sidetracking here, but like. Sometimes I will be in bed with Lauren and I will be like perfectly awake and can't fall asleep. And she'll say something like, hey, you still awake? And I'm like, yeah, how'd you know I was still awake? And she'll be like, because you weren't snoring. Oh. <laughs> and so I need to, I, what I need to do is like record my um, snores so yeah. I can imitate them perfectly. Like, you know, lull her into a false sense of security. No, no, that's, that's not no, what I No, I think she do. definitely, I think she, it's like white noise to her now, which I think is cute because like the vast majority of people that I know that have partners that snore, they're just like, this is the worst thing ever. I hate it so much. And you I just appreciate have a partner that. who loves you in every way. But her other choice of white noise is like turning on episodes of The Office. So I'm not <laughs> sure if that's good or bad. I don't know. Joel, you're just like Dwight Schrute. I love you. Ugh. <laughs> uh, okay. So now let's talk about uh, connections. Um, and this is, you know, what we need to feel close. And it's about building emotional intimacy or building physical intimacy. Um, so as she points out, like, sex is complicated. She has problems with her partner at times. Sometimes, you know, Xander does things that she doesn't like, and she feels bad, and she doesn't want to talk about it. And she knows she should talk about it. But like, she is feeling emotional and doesn't want to go through like the motions of like having to engage. Um, and, and so she's like, look, you know, we have to understand that like often physical intimacy is tied very closely to emotional intimacy. It's very difficult to feel sexually attracted to someone if you don't like feel that they respect you or you're having some kind of problem with them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, as she talks about, um, you kind of can see it similar to the spontaneous versus reactive styles of sex that we talked about in part one. You know, there are some people who need like arousal in order to have like, uh, well, how do I phrase? Some people need the mental, mental to have the physical. Some people need the physical reactions to have the mental. And the same yeah. way, you know, some people want connections before they have sex and some people want to have sex so that they feel they have connections, right? It's another way of looking at relationships. They're definitely different things. And I can imagine, you know, all the combinations you have there where there are some people with physical then mental who feel connected and then sex, right? Right, right. Like you can, you can imagine it's just another way of like describing the different paradigms people fall into. Mm -hmm. So when she's when she talks about this, she's like, look, um, a lot of men um, see sex as little more than a physical act. And a lot of people find that like partners, physical needs can be an annoyance or a burden. 
And she says, you know, when your partner wants to be intimate with you, it may feel like they're just horny and need a release, and you're merely the vessel. This can be especially true if you're a cis woman in a relationship with a cis man, since there are so many stereotypes of men wanting sex regardless of the circumstances. But in many instances, that's not really what's going on for your partner. Even if they seem sex-crazed, they still want to feel emotionally connected to you. The reason why men are often the ones who want physical intimacy first has a lot to do with socialization. But it's simply, women are given societal permission to be emotional creatures, whereas men are taught that they're not supposed to have any feelings. Many of my male clients, even the ones who are more evolved in this caveman-era socialization, have shared with me that the only way they felt comfortable seeking connection is through sex. Most men simply do not have the capacity to say, I want to feel close to you right now. So, um, she wow. says, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, wow. Like, that's that's very oh. profound. <laughs> wow. Like Owen Wilson. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Can that be can that be your negative inner critic whenever you like are are, are beating up on yourself? Be like, shut up, Owen Wilson. He's like, Oh, wow, <laughs> don't be so mean to me. No, because My every dog time I think of Owen Wilson now, died. That's so sad. But every time I think of Owen Wilson, I just think of J Lo now, and I don't want to think about J Lo that often. <laughs> So she goes on and says, if you're an emotional intimacy first person, and especially if your partner seems to want sex more often than you do, you've probably been more focused on the quantity than the quality of sex. But you have to understand the common thread that you and your partner are both seeking, truly vulnerable intimate moments where time stands still and it's just the two of you. Whether you're having that experience through sex or through some other sort of activity, it's the connection you're both truly saying, you're both truly craving. So the next time your partner grumbles, yo, want to do it? While they scratch the back of their neck, you take a deep breath and picture your partner standing right in front of you, their hand on their heart, saying to you, I love you and I want to be close to you right now. Does that change how you feel about their desires? And don't worry, she says, she'll help you learn better initiation techniques in the next chapter. So, uh, there are some important things that you need to figure out for your partner. Ask your partner things like, do you like to feel emotionally connected first before having sex, or does sex feel like your primary way to create emotional connection? If your partner wants connection first, you should ask them things like, what specific things help you feel connected to me? And what does sex feel like for you when we have that baseline of emotional connection? If your partner wants sex first, you should ask them, can you describe to me how sex creates that feeling of emotional connection for you? How do you feel after sex as opposed to before? I feel like that's a really good, the, especially the last question is a really good question to ask, just because I feel like sometimes when you're having casual sex, um, it's hard to differentiate if you're doing it because you want to feel wanted or you're doing it because of the physical aspect. Right. Right. Uh, so there are some more specific questions you can ask your partner about emotional connections. Um, so things like what are three to five specific things that help you feel connected to me? This is pretty much the same question as earlier, but like a little more specific. What are your three to five favorite ways to receive love? What are your three to five favorite ways to show me love? And if I want to, quote, push your buttons in a positive way, what is the best way for me to do it? So that can be a weird conversation. I don't know if everyone has three to five things like off the top of their head that they could refer to. I think this is probably something that needs to happen like over time, like ask the question and then, you know, get feedback about it over the course of a week or so. Uh, but the mm -hmm. thing she points out is like, again, this needs to be a continuous thing. It can't be like a one and done. Again, people's desires, people's, you know, motivations, the things people feel emotionally get attracted to are going to change over time. So she suggests a way to keep it super practical. And that is starting every day with the question, what do you need to feel connected to me today? Or how can I support us in feeling close to each other today? Create a ritual around that connection. And she's going to give some more advice in part three about how to like establish these rit uh, rituals. Um, and then also make sure to give each other praise and feedback when you get it. So like if you say, hey, I feel emotionally connected when we like cook together, give feedback as you're cooking together. Be like, I appreciate you spending this time with me and I feel so close to you right now. Okay. Oh my God, Naomi, this is, this is so helpful, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is like the first book that both you and I have really actually like left. Okay, this isn't the first book. This is one of the first, first to, like books. Yeah, first this year that we've that we've <laughs> actually really enjoyed and found helpful. Because I feel like we found other books helpful. Like, why does he do that? And and this book, and I feel like there's one more, but the rest of them have just been dumps on Steve Harvey and Marvin Gaye and yeah. 
Was that his Martin name? Gay? Martin Gay? What? No. What was his name? Marvin Gaines? Oh, um, Myron Gaines. Myron, I was like, what's your go. issue with there Marvin Gaye, Naomi? Do you not like <laughs> his music? Good lord. Okay, so another big problem is you're going to have this dynamic of, you know, some people in relationships want emotional connection and then sex. Some people want sex in order to form emotional connections, right? That That's one issue you're going to have to work through. But another one is, like, a lot of people who have this, like, emotional connection prior to sex idea or, like, feeling are going to be kind of suspicious of any kind of touch from their partners. Um, and this can be something that's, like, unfortunately reinforced a lot by, as Naomi points out, you know, people having casual sex, the patterns you learn from dating, where, like, a lot of physical touch is meant to be a lead-up, implying that there will be sex at some point. You know, there's whole books about pickup artistry techniques where it's, like, casually you know break the touch barrier you know touch her on the shoulder and then wrap your arm around her and then you can start making out with her and so i think you know a lot of people especially cis women are suspicious of physical touching and this can be weird if you have a relationship where there are some people you know who want sex to form the connection some people who want the emotional affection form sex and so you need to break yourself of this idea that all touching is going to inevitably lead to sex And this is important for, like, both parties, both the people who are suspicious of, like, their partner's intention and for the people who, like, want sex in order to form emotional connections. You both can benefit from, you know, changing kind of how touch works in a relationship. So there's no perception in the relationship that any time you want to be intimate with your partner, whether it be a hug or a kiss or a smack on the butt, that it's an attempt to lead into sex, right? I think that you are doing a great job of describing it, but I think that we need to give more of an example in order to give a full picture of what she's talking about, because I don't think that everyone necessarily has connected that this could be a problem in their relationship. So I will give an example for me at least, which is I used to live with my partner and now I don't. And so We used to have those everyday physical interactions like hugging and kissing and things like that that were normal and they were um, innocent in the sense that they weren't going to lead to sex. But now that I see my partner once to twice a week, if not less frequently, it it feels as if those are always going to be leading to sex and those inappropriate like okay, I'm not going to say inappropriate. That's a bad word. But those those actions are obviously, it feels like to me, they're always leading to something. So I sat down with yeah. my partner this week after listening to this book and I was like, hey, how can we fix this? And I listened to her tips. Joel, take it away. What are her tips for this? Okay. So she, yeah, she does give some like actually useful tips. And this comes after a section where she's discussing some of her clients who have run into similar instances to Naomi. Um, And so the first one is doing something called touch time. This is an actual exercise you should do. And that is getting both partners to understand that like sometimes touch can just be enjoyable for the sake of touch, not necessarily because it's going to lead to anything. So she says every day, set aside at least five minutes for non-sexual touch time. You can, you can also turn it into a sweet ritual by always doing it at the same time or setting up your space in a special way. This is your opportunity to connect to each other and to learn to enjoy these simple pleasures of touch. So it can be something like five minutes cuddling in bed at the end of every day. There's a burp again. Oh, man. (laughs) But yeah, it's literally the act of, like, hugging. It's the act of being close to your partner. It's the act of skin-on-skin contact. It is all of, like, the positive stuff associated with touch and all the sensations that come with it without any of the, like, hey, this might lead to additional stuff. And she's like, very explicitly, this needs to be a non-sexual act right? If every time you are connecting with your partner, you are trying to initiate sex, your partner is going to feel kind of uncomfortable if, you know, they're feeling sick, they're feeling tired, they're feeling depressed, all the other stuff we talked about. Mm -hmm. Another exercise is the 30 and the 6. So she says there have been two forms of physical touch that have been scientifically proven to lead to a deeper connection. Um, I would kind of like to see a citation here, but she did not include one. Um, She says the 30 second hug and the 6 second kiss are the two examples. So oxytocin, otherwise known as the cuddle hormone or the love hormone, makes us feel relaxed, trusting, and connected to our loved ones. It gets released after 20 to 30 seconds of touch and about six seconds of kissing. So if you want a simple way to add more connection to a relationship, make the space for one 30-second hug and one six-second kiss every single day. 
Okay. I like that. Then the last thing is, um, she does note that, like, there's a decent number of people who have jobs or experiences that make them feel, quote, touched out. So one example is primary caretakers. Um, they can get touched out after being in physical contact with their kids all day. You've been touched, poked, prodded, latched onto, and grabbed that for hours. And the thought of having any more physical contact makes your skin crawl. If you have a baby, they may literally rely on your body for nourishment and comfort. And you may be in skin-to-skin contact with them the majority of the day. Um, you also may feel disconnected from your body if you've recently given birth, which can further complicate the sensation. Um, and so obviously that's going to make your relationship with your partner a little more difficult if they want to touch you, whether it be in a non-sexual or sexual manner. And you're going to have to, you know, figure out a way in order to get over that. So she says it's it's kind of like you've just had a big meal and you're feeling stuffed, right? It's not as though, like, there's a piece of pie in front of you and you think that piece of pie is disgusting. It's that you don't want that piece of pie right now. Right, you've always already had a lot of the stuff that like you enjoy or that you can tolerate, and now you just need some time alone. And so she says, if you're feeling touched out, you probably need more support. You're probably not going to get in a place where you never feel touched out. You can definitely lessen the frequency and intensity. So one of the most effective solutions is to prioritize alone time for yourself every day. You need the opportunity to come home to your body and reconnect with yourself before you can connect with anyone else. A 2018 survey found that, on average, parents have only 32 minutes a day to themselves. Um, I assume that's waking hours. I would hope that their sleep hours are not, you know, surrounded by kids as well. But you also have to uh, think like those... To try to get those... more alone time. Sorry, I was just going to say that you also have to think about the fact that those are probably minutes in the shower, minutes driving away from your child's school, or um, on the toilet. Like, they aren't, like, actual, like minutes alone i feel like i I think that's possible um but yeah whatever it takes try to get some more alone time even if all you can manage some days is one extra minute that's something you have a decent chunk of time trying to do an activity involving your body like going for a nap going for a walk around the block or dancing to your favorite song if you have only 60 seconds to spare close your eyes take slow deep breaths a little sensory deprivation can work wonders when you're overstimulated um, finally, you need to make sure you're having sex that is for you, not just for your partner. Your enjoyment and pleasure have to be equally important. As some person from their Instagram community puts it, I need touch that is giving and not taking. I get taking touch the entire day. She says that, like, we'll get to it more in later chapters in the book, but if the sex feels one-sided, it's understandable you want to withdraw from it. Um, and so then she suggests, like, another exercise, and that's sitting down with a partner and being like, hey, let's brainstorm some ways that I can get more time to myself because I'm feeling touched out. Like, I would like to be engaged with you. I would like to, you know, enjoy the sensation of touching with you. And if, you know, that's not something I can get to right now, we need to figure out a way to restore that feeling in me. So with that, I think we are done with the chapter, Naomi. Uh, We have more awaiting us in part three, where I think we're probably going to be able to wrap up this bad boy. Uh, But yeah, I think both of those conversations, both acknowledgement and connection, are super important for relationships. And I'm really glad that she is acknowledging them in tangible, meaningful ways. Yeah, I uh, really enjoy this book. And like I'm going to mention again, go pick this up, listen to it, read it, something. I think that these are vital conversations to not only have with your partner about your sex life, but just general good communication rules for every part, every aspect of your life. I agree. Um, you know, and I want to reiterate what I said in their last episode that, uh, if you do pick up a copy, make sure you buy it from a reputable seller. Don't get scammed. Don't buy the like 20 page manifesto that I purchased on accident. Um, you know, I, I know she has it, you know, being sold first party through a lot of publishers. If you do enjoy authors, if you do think their content is meaningful, make sure they get, you know, the full cut of the sale, make sure that, you know, they, um, see a reason to continue offering high quality content to the masses because yeah, the publishing industry kind of sucks right now and it's good to make sure that the few people putting out high quality content are being rewarded for their efforts. Uh, not, you know, stepped on, uh, don't do genocide. Don't support genocide. Um, kick a genocider. Okay. Got it. Wear a condom too, while you're doing it. Yeah. I don't (laughs) like that.
We have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at Date These Guys or visit datetheseguys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, send an email to datetheseguys at gmail.com. If you're looking to make an impact in the world, this show strongly recommends Planned Parenthood, a nonprofit organization that provides reproductive health care in the United States. Planned Parenthood provides birth control, long acting reversible contraceptive implants, clinical breast examinations, pregnancy screenings, prenatal care, testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, and abortions. They also do great work for those who are lower income. Four fifths of their clients are at or below 50% of the federal poverty line. Both Joel and Naomi are monthly donors to Planned Parenthood. We hope you will be too.